is whenever you want. You can start. I can start. I can start. Okay, so welcome everyone uh, to the first science cafe of the autumn season. Uh, and uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to have here Dr. Auli Bloyer from the Natural Resources Institute Finland. I had to laugh because, <laughs> because just before I, I said, oh, I will never remember, it's too long of a name, but then it's written there, so it's much easier. Um, and uh, she will talk about something that is uh, a little bit different from our um, previous science cafe. This is about human-animal uh, relationships in medieval Turku. And um, Auli, you said you will talk a little bit also about the archaeology perspective uh, of, of this. And uh, well, as you know, uh, we have, uh, as usual, first the science cafe um, talks, uh, and then there will be discussions and the uh, question and answers for those of you who are here for the first time. Um, Auli, the floor is yours. Thank you. I do hope that my <coughs> voice will carry through this. Um, I'm coming down with the flu, but um, so please be patient if I start to <coughs> cough too much. But yes, so um, uh, it's great pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Um, so first I was thinking that I will tell you a little bit about um, who I am and what I do because I think that um, zoo archaeologist is not a very common occupation in, in, in well, not in Finland, but not in the world either. So, um, zoo archaeologist, I study animal bones that are excavated from archaeological excavations. And um, I first started uh, to study archaeology here in Turku, um, then I realized that the zoo archaeology was something that I liked. So um, I went to Stockholm University for two years. And uh, there you can, you, you can learn about the archaeological bone studies, not, uh, not in Finland at all. Then I came back, did my uh, master's thesis and PhD um, to University of Turku, archaeology. Um, and they were about the uh, bone material that has been excavated from the town of Turku. So this topic that I'm going to talk about today is based um, um, very much on that um, in, in information that I did for my um, PhD. I analyzed um, 1,500 kilograms of bones. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, and now, yes, I'm um, working in the Natural Resources Institute Finland, so that is Luonovara Keskus in, in Finnish. Um, and I'm doing, um, I'm Academy Fellow for, for Academy of Finland, and I'm doing now a project that examines the animal husbandry in the uh, northern Baltic region. <coughs> but yes. So today, Beyond Bones, Human-Animal Relationship in Medieval Turku. This modern lifestyle we have nowadays, this is actually, a, from archaeological point of view, this is a very new era in the human-animal relationship. And I think that this is one of the reasons why um, today there is a great interest on the topic. It is very much um, research in the, in the archaeology and in the his history. These kind of topics are um, very, very important at the moment. And really, this is the first time in human history that we actually can live our everyday life without animal contact, without animal presence, or animal dependence. So this is actually something quite new. Um, if we think this from the archaeological perspective um, that I'm studying, First, and you know, in, in, in Finland, for, for, for example, first the people were hunter gatherers here. They hunted, they fished um, for their everyday subsistence. So, animals, um, their killing, their animal products were a very, very major part of people's lives. Um, 
Then people adopted animal husbandry. The animal-human relationship was different, but still very uh, central of, uh, in their lives. The animals were living in the same settlement sites, even um, and humans and animals shared the same buildings uh, during certain uh, time pe periods. So they were living under the same roof. Um, and taking care of the animals, breeding animals, uh, was the daily chores of people. Practically every member of the society, almost every member of the society. And even when you come to medieval or post-medieval period, and even if you think about the uh, urban context in Finland, the animals were ever present. They were practically unavoidable. Animals were everywhere. They were a big part um, of people's lives. And so unlike today, when you can live quite animalless life if you choose to, um, during the previous periods you couldn't. And I think this um, uh, change is one of the changes that we are going through now and we are uh, in, in, in a society we are thinking a lot about these animal human issues at the moment and um, so today we look to the past and see how um, the things were during the medieval period um, first I'm going to tell a little bit about how the medieval animals can be studied because I think that um, this is not subject that that people know very much about so mo most about osteology then I'm going to uh, tell shortly about the animals in the medieval Turku and then I'm going to uh, speak of the meaning of animals in Turku so the human animal relationship what kind of role did animals have in in people's lives but before that I think it might be interesting to change perspective a little bit. Um, because humans and animals share the same urban space uh, here in Turku. And most of the presentation will be about the human-animal human relationship from human perspective, because um, that's what I am humanist, so I study past human behavior. However, I'm also a zoo archaeologist, so I study the animal bones, so the animals themselves as well. So for me, it is also natural to wonder um, how the things are from the animal perspective. And so what would be the history of Turku from animal point of view? So first, um, I was uh, thinking that we could look a little bit about um, Turku from animal perspective and from pig's perspective because um, I, I, I think pig was one of the um, typical animals in medieval Turku. So um, first if we think about the um, history of Turku uh, before the urban phase there was probably a um, small village or a farm here um, in the very early medieval period before the town was grounded. And uh, what would a pigs think about this village face? I think as a social animals, they would think that uh, that too was a quiet, simple life. Um, uh, perhaps even quite lonely because people didn't keep that much pigs um, in the uh, rural area in Finland. Uh, the life was probably very free. They could uh, run around freely um, among the uh, other animals. The idea was that um, you put fences around the places you didn't want animals to go. You didn't pen animals in. So it was like the other way around. You, did, you put fences around the fields, for example, and then you uh, let the animals roam loose. So probably pigs were running uh, freely around the um, a farm and village and the surrounding landscape. Um, perhaps there even was some oak trees left during that period. And um, so uh, in the winter time, or in, in the autumn time, they could find the, uh, the uh, acorns and feed on them. Happy, happy, quiet, simple life. And then things change and people build a town 
here. And uh, animals started this urban lifestyle, just like humans. Um, it would be busy. It would be much more social. There would be many, many more pigs around. People probably were trying to uh, restrict their movements more than in the village. They were probably trying to keep them in, in the, uh, the yards, in the pens. Um, however, they probably escaped quite a lot and were running around in, in town. Um, there were opportunities. For example, horses were plentiful and horse droppings available in the streets. That was nice. Um, also, um, there were some negative sides. Um, there were dangers as well. Um, we know that um, in the in the archaeological from the archaeological bone material that quite a many pigs had injuries here in in Turku, probably because they were running freely in the in the town and uh, in the busy streets, um, people uh, accidents could happen. Horse, horses could kick them. Um, uh, they could have fights with dogs, for example. So I, I, I think that uh, this is the heyday of, of uh, from, from um, heyday of Turku from peak point of view. There's lots happening, a lot of opportunities, uh, happy, quite free life still. But then something happens, um, uh, things start to slow down. First, the number of pigs kept in town um, is decreasing. People are yeah, breeding less and less pigs. And then in the end, in the, in the 20th century, people are not breeding the pigs anymore. They are just bringing perhaps one piglet in the, in the springtime, keeping it in, un, until autumn, and then slaughtering it. So from a um, pig's uh, perspective, this is like the uh, end of the big town in Turku. So it's quite a different history that, um, from a pig's point of view than from a human's point of view. But yeah, to continue, um, f uh, the animals in Turku were, so they were important part of er everyday life. Um, there are different sources that we can use when we study the ancient animals. Uh, first is the bone material that I will be uh, telling you more, more about. This is the, uh, my main area of research. But there are also um, uh, historical sources um, and also um, archaeological artifacts are telling uh, uh, us about the uh, animal and animal breeding. And then there are archaeological buildings like cow sheds or stables that um, tell us that, uh, that animals were kept in towns. Also, the uh, Turku archaeological layers consist mostly on manure. So we know that uh, <coughs> animals were um, kept here from that perspective as well. Um, the historical sources are very useful when you come to the post-medieval period. But during the medieval period, uh, we don't have many many um, his historical uh, records of uh, animals in Turku. So um, for this period, our knowledge comes mostly from, from the bones. <clears throat> and the, so the archaeological bone material comes from archaeological excavations. Um, um, you know that the archaeological excavations destroyed the site. We destroy what I uh, we love. <laughs> we dig out the sites and then we radiocarbon date the remains and they are destroyed in the process as well. Rough life. Rough love um, is archaeologist love. And then the bones that are found um, in, the, in the excavations, they are backed according to the layers of features they are found in. That is uh, obviously very important so that later on we know where exactly they were found. Uh, from what uh, uh, dating and what feature, where they found in a well, where they found in a building or in a yard. Later on, I will talk a little bit more about that perspective. Um, the bones that are uh, in, the, in the archaeological layers, they come from very um, several different um, activities. Part are uh, food waste 
coming from kitchen. Part comes from uh, craft activities, for example, tanning or bone working. Uh, some are ritually deposit bones. So, um, and some are animals that have lived um, and died in Turku, pretty much regardless of humans, like uh, rats or mice or frogs. So when you analyze the bones and then interpret them, you have to keep in mind that um, uh, they, they origin can be from a various kind of activities. It's not definitely all kitchen waste. And then very shortly about the um, basic zoo archaeology, how um, the zoo archaeology a trick is done. So how do we identify the bones from the archaeological excavations? Um, it all is based from actually a very simple notion that the, uh, all the um, creatures with bones have actually quite the same structure. We don't, it's so obvious we don't even think about it. But you know, animals like frogs and, and well, there's human, seal, frog, and bat skeleton there. And you can see that, that obviously they all consist of, of head, so a skull, a lower jaw, limbs, and spine and trunk. Um, it is so simple that we really don't think that um, often that this similarity goes way beyond um, this um, general um, similarity. So it goes much deeper. So if we, for example, look uh, here at the tight bones of different animals, it is easy to see that they all actually um, look quite similar. They all have this kind of round head. This is the um, uh, head of fe uh, femur that goes into the socket in your hip bone. Here is the um, lower end, and you can see that here, here is a similar structure here. This is a place for uh, patella, the knee knap. And um, it, is, it is easy to see that they all like are variations from the same theme. So this is human bone here, and this is, for example, is a pig. But there are more, perhaps, similarities than there are differences. Um, here are the toe bones of, of different animals. Again, you see that in the upper row here, uh, the bones are quite similar. Uh, here is human bone. Here is um, a horse bone. And you, you, you can see that they are surprisingly similar. The differences come when you go down the row. So this is the third uh, toe bone. So this is um, the hoof of, of, of horse, and this is the fingertip of human. And there you can see the, similar, uh, the, 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 the differences emerging, because um, here we see uh, the specialization of these uh, structures. So uh, some are made for running, some are made for grasping, some are made perhaps catching prey. Um, uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> well, hopefully it won't activate. Um, but yes, um, so identifying complete bones uh, might be difficult, but then in the archaeological excavations you get only those little fragments of bones. Sorry, no, sorry. do you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, you, you get these little pieces of bones. This is a complete sheep tibia, so a uh, shin bone. And uh, here is a fragment of it found from an archaeological excavation. And you can see that, OK, it is the same bit at this one here. It's luckily from the spot that we can actually say that it is sheep, not, for example, a goat and a pig that are the same size and surprisingly uh, similarly structured. Uh, if this bit would be found from uh, in the shaft part, I'm not at all sure that it could be I identified.
But yeah, so the material is very fragmented and the uh, identification is sometimes very challenging. We do it using the reference collection. So we compare the archaeological bone material with the um, uh, bones of known species that we have in the reference collection. So it's really visual comparison of shape and size. We also record um, uh, the uh, sex of the um, species, uh, the, the, the bone element, if we can know it, for, for example, um, uh, the uh, roosters have the spurs in, in, in their legs, so they are easy to uh, separate from hens. Then, if the bones are complete, we can take measurements, uh, tooth wear, and tooth eruption will tell us about the animal age. Uh, some pa pathologies will be seen in the bones, for example, healed fractures. Uh, also, we um, record cut marks in, in the bones so that we can, for example, see if the animals were skinned or not. And then uh, the preservation of the bone. And this um, uh, information goes to a database together with the contextual data, so where the bone was found from, so that then we can combine the results from the osteological analysis with the data where the bone was found from and to reveal the patterns of animal husbandry utilization and the meaning. And for example, we can study uh, consumption and production patterns uh, that comes from animal age and sex data. For example, we know that in medieval Turku, people were eating much uh, more younger cattle than then during the post-medieval period, the cattle consumed was much more elderly, so perhaps of less quality, possibly. We can also track activity zones around the town. We know where the um, uh, areas that were used for different crafts were. Uh, we can locate where the uh, kitchen dumps were, so the kitchens were located nearby. And then, obviously, we can also focus on the animals, what the uh, animals were like, um, and look at the different pathologies, uh, size changes, and differences in the deposition of different animals. And then shortly about the animals in Turku <laughs> during the medieval period, Horses, dogs, cats, cattle, goats, pigs, and probably sheep were kept in town. We are pretty sure about all the rest, but sheep, uh, we are not totally sure. They were obviously eaten and consumed in town, but they were probably brought in for more rural area. Also, um, people got um, fish and game from outside uh, Turku, and uh, quite a lot of other domestic animals were brought here for slaughter as well. And then they were living, um, wild animals were also living in town. Rats, mice, voles, frogs, and birds were also around here, uh, regardless of humans. And animals were really present in their everyday life. And people were really seeing the cycle of animal birth, life, and death in their own yards, because um, we know again from the archaeological record um, that um, animals were really kept in town and uh, they, were, they, they were breeding here. So uh, little pigs, piglets were born, calf were born in the town area. Some of them died. Um, then people raised the animals um, in their yards, in the town, and then they were slaughtered in their uh, own backyards. They did not buy processed meat or ready-cut meat pieces for the animals that they raised themselves or bought from rural area. Um, they were brought into their own yards and then slaughtered there and uh, preserved for, for the winter. So from their yards we find uh, all sort of um, bones from all sort of these activities. There are slaughter waste, there are butchery waste, there are kitchen waste, and then, and then there are the bones of the uh, stillborn animals that died as young. Um, and then the animals obviously had very different roles to these people. Um, 
first of all, obviously, um, they were used for these animal products. This is like the material aspect of, of the animals. They were used for um, milking and for meat. Um, in the rural area, animals were source of manure, and that was very important um, role indeed. But in town, that was different. Um, they were not uh, needed for that. But they were needed for raw material, wool, hides, horn, bones, and fat. Fat was used, for example, for um, making candles. Quite important. Horses were used for riding, trod oxen for pulling carts. And then um, animals were also source for trade goods. So hides and butter were among um, the trade goods that were exported from, from Turku. So for the merchants that um, traded those goods, animals were important, again, in a, from a little different angle. They were probably very concerned about the animal husbandry, state of animal husbandry around Turku, so that they could get um, enough trade goods for them. And because the, these products uh, partly came from animals that people were living with, there was probably a bit different, that brought a bit different aspect to these um, um, uh, material uh, things as well. Because, for, for, for example, you may have a skate uh, made of, of animal bone that um, was quite common. And you may have known the animal that the bones came from. It might have been your own old horse, for, for, for example. You perhaps knew that, OK, this candle now that I'm, I'm doing uh, or using uh, comes from that um, angry uh, black-horned ram, for, for example. So um, again, the animal and the animal um, uh, individuals also were present in humans' lives in very, very many different ways. Not only as I uh, living in individuals or as products, but as individuals in the products as well. Um, then there are other aspects of this human-animal relationship in medieval town. Uh, there were also some negative effects having so many domestic animals nearby. Obviously, there was a great deal of the manure. Uh, they brought in some insects. And then there was also a possibility of physical encounter, because the animals were roaming free also in, 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 in the town. So and pigs can be quite vicious if, if, if they want to. So there was uh, this aspect as well. It was not all bliss and, and happy, happiness with the animals. Also, uh, bears and wolves that were hunted around uh, Turku during the medieval period, we know from the archaeological bone record that they were actually brought sometimes to Turku. And, um, well, there is little reason, perhaps, from the material point of view. If you want the skins, you can skin them where you hunted them and then just bring in the skins. But we know that they brought also the carcasses to Turku. And one reason could be that um, uh, these were the hunters boasting with their, um, with their game, you know, bringing them in as trophies to, to, to Turku. And then uh, this is the uh, difficult question about the pets in the, in the medieval Turku. Um, humans had this uh, kind of um, uh, practical material relationship with the, with the animals. They had also this negative uh, relationship with the animals. Uh, but did they have pets like we uh, think in a modern um, society? Oh, uh, that is very a difficult question. We know that they had dogs and cats. But what was the role of the dogs and cats? Well, we know, for example, that they were skinned during the medieval period. Um, here, oh, sorry. Here is um, a cat bone um, that um, ha has been worked 
it, it was never finished, but they were planning to do something about it. Uh, this is a cut mark. This is the cut mark. They were probably uh, marking the spot uh, that they would cut the ends loose and keep the shaft. It made a, a perfect round a tube. And whoever was doing this knew this because a uh, cat is the only animal that you can get this you know, uh, symmetrical, beautiful round tube from. So um, we also know that uh, the animals, uh, cats, were seen this way. But it is really difficult to say from the, from the um, animal bone material if the cats also held this different aspect. And I think that what perhaps sometimes uh, tend to be forgotten when we think about the uh, things long past is that humans were different individuals then as well. Um, I'm sure that there were these people that utilized cats um, uh, skinning and, and making, making a bone object from them. But again, this cat may have been in, uh, while it was living, still a beloved pet. That doesn't uh, exclude that. There were probably people then that were more um, animal lovers than the others, just like today. And then this is also interesting one. This is a, a skull of raven that was found um, in Turku from a latrine. And I'm in, in, in few slides, I'm going to say a few words about that latrine. It's very interesting. Um, but then again, um, is this just a raven that happened to flew in Turku and died here? Is this a raven that was hunted and you know, brought in Turku? Or was this a pet raven? I think that's uh, actually quite a good possibility that this animal was uh, somebody's pet here, here in Turku. Um, and in the future, I hope that we can examine this thing by looking at the isotopes um, of these bones. So seeing what kind of diet did this animal had. Then we can, uh, again, approach the different roles of the animals as a pets if they were fed differently than the others. But yeah, that's for the future. But yeah, I, uh, I think that uh, this might be actually the, our best bet for a pet in medieval Turku. Um, then animals also had quite um, specified symbolic and ritual meanings. Um, animals in uh, people's life are also used as symbols. We can see that if we look at the church paintings. Um, they are the medieval uh, wall paintings in churches are full of animals that have the uh, symbolic use there. Um, also, animal bones have sometimes a very specific use in symbols or rituals. Sometimes something that we have difficulties in grasping. Um, why, for example, uh, penis bones of seal were brought in Turku when rest of the seal was not? There are several penis bones of, of seal found here in Turku. Other seal finds are very, very rare. So it's apparent that these bones were, were um, uh, sampled and brought in Turku. Why? Perhaps they uh, were used for as a medicine, perhaps they had some symbolic use, perhaps they were used in some rituals. But clearly that bone and you know that bone from that animal had some some specific meaning to medieval people. And then shortly about the animal bones from the medieval latrine that I was talking about. Uh, well latrine is well it's like a toilet. It's a shaft that is dug, or pit, big pit that is dug to the ground, and um, well used as a, as, a, as a toilet. In Finnish, huusi is the, is the um, word, I think. And uh, I was privileged to analyze the material. So the bottom fill was the period 
from the period that it was used as a toilet. And not much about that, although there were some bones, because people were eating a lot of fish, and fish bones can go through a uh, human digestive system. But then the interesting part was um, found when we examined the fill of the latrine. So at some point they decided that they didn't want to use it anymore, and they used a uh, medium material uh, to fill the pit. And the, the filling itself was not that um, interesting. Um, they apparently just dug some soil from a yard and dump it into, into the latrine. So that soil was full of, um, well, animal bones, pottery class, everything that you would ex uh, expect to find in, in the normal medieval dump. But when they were filling it, they were also adding some things to it, like a kitten, young chicken, the raven skull I was um, talking about earlier, and one wing bone from the uh, raven, and then sheep skull and mandible. Now comes the difficult part. Why these people were doing this? Um, is it just that, okay, we, were, we are filling now a pit. We happen to have one dead kitten, one dead young chicken, this uh, uh, raven skull and sheep uh, head. And we use this opportunity just to dump it and get rid of them. But we know from other examples that um, these could well be ritual deposits uh, intended to kind of close the um, uh, structure because it was considered um, in a way also a dangerous, potentially dangerous um, uh, place because it, uh, it, it, it was a structure that went deep into the earth. So uh, quite often in Europe, for example, these structures, when they were filled, uh, something um, like this was also added to it um, to make sure that it was closed properly and, for example, nothing could come up uh, from it anymore. But yeah, this is the, uh, this is the um, um, difficult part of, of the interpretation. So this could well be uh, ritual animals um, or then they were just rubbish um, again uh, if we um, we do have the context information of some of them and it definitely looks like more likely that they are ritually deposited than by chance but yeah it's um, um, not always easy to grasp um, the human actions behind these physical, physical um, remains. But I think this is my last slide. Um, to sum up, I would like to say that um, as you have seen, the human-animal relationship during the medieval period in Turku was quite different from the one we have now. For example, if we now want to see a pig in Turku, we have to go to the Kupittaan puisto, or then to see Posankka. Um, if this would be a medieval place, there would probably be, a, well, cats or dogs lurking around, looking for food inside here. When we go out, there would be more dogs, uh, horses, cattle, um, uh, brought in from pasture of South Town, coming in, coming out, uh, all sort of animals all around us all the time. And uh, uh, I think this is one of the uh, big questions we are facing now. Uh, how do we define a modern animal human relationship? And um, this is interesting to, to compare. With the, with the past, because um, for the humans, it has been very natural to live with animals all the time, and now we are not doing it. So no wonder it's such a difficult subject at the moment for us. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Um, this was very interesting and the very first zooarchaeologist talk in the Science Cafe. So we are um, for sure having uh, uh, many questions, or I guess here is the first. Well, thinking about uh, the health perspective in this medieval time, uh, you may know that, uh, <coughs> well, we know that uh, the children living in farms nowadays, they have uh, better health, you know, with, they have better immunity, they don't have allergies. How would you consider the times at the medieval time uh, with this common life, the joint life of, of animals and humans? Uh, how do you see the risks and the benefits of, of uh, animals living together with, with humans at that time? And how would you, let's say, transfer into the, uh, the modern world, modern times? Would it be possible to come back to this time that we will have, I don't say that there will be pigs running around, but I mean to, to bring back the health that they may give you? Thank you. That was an excellent question. Um, I think for the medieval period, the um, negative effects were greater than the positive ones, because the positive one would be to have allergy or asthma, and the negative effect would be to have a real um, dangerous um, diseases or, or accidents um, and no modern health care. And, um, you know, milk was drinking without uh, the pasteurization of it. You could get some uh, serious diseases that way as well. Uh, but, yeah, definitely I suspect that they did not suffer from asthma or allergies because, yeah, they, they, they were living um, surrounded with the animals. But because we now have the modern health care and we know these things, it might be a very interesting idea to try to think how to really get the benefits and not the negative effects. Yes, question. Uh, when, when the animals all walk around freely, were they owned by any specific family or? Yeah. Yep, they were, they were owned and we know that they were, for example, their ears were clipped so that people could recognize them late, la later. Um, the idea was that um, if they were running more freely. People did not need to feed them that much because they could find their own food. And we know from the uh, rural area from Finland uh, d uh, during the later period that in a village people tried to get the peoples out of their night pens as early as possible so that they could also eat the neighbor's waste as well. So, so they were owned. Uh, although we, we don't know about cats. Yeah, that is more tricky question. Probably part of the cats were feral or feralish, at least. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Oh, yes actually, yeah, yes. Okay. Um, of course. Okay, I know that this is not question for osteology, but but you are okay expert in uh, of uh, animal human relations. So let's touch a little bit the dark side. So. What about, because uh, animals were uh, living so close to human there, and often uh, you could ask, what about um, uh, zoophilia or bees? Uh, what is it? Uh, bees? Okay, zoophilia. Bestiality. Bestiality, yes, that's the word, yes, actually. That time. Okay, I, ask, I guess you can't find any remnant of those uh, from, from boats, right? No. But otherwise. No. Yeah, um, well, in theory, that might be possible if, um, I, I mean, this is not my speciality, but I kind of recall that they, um, they, uh, they killed the animals and buried them in a special way, perhaps somewhere. Uh, so it, it is theoretically possible to find those remnants, but no, I don't think any has been recognized. So yeah, that, that aspect is really difficult to identify from the bone material. Yeah. Uh, if, if you find local animal products like leather or bone handles, how do you know it came from local animals? Or is that just the assumption that it was? Um, uh, in theory, we don't. Um, uh, in practice, um, the historical sources tell us something about um, the um, sources of bone or leather that people used. So um, we know that um, 
they were done by in very small scale by local craftsmen. And so if we find um, a bone object that is uh, a really skillfully done, or leather object that is really skillfully done, we then may assume that it's not local, it's most likely foreign. Um, however, we quite often find um, the very simple ones that were used in every, everyday life. Um, then we assume that they're most likely from uh, uh, locally done, and then they are from local animals. But yeah, um, to be sure, um, well, in theory, sometimes you could perhaps do isotopic studies for it. Yeah, but yeah. So, uh, so you, you talked about uh, uh, human-animal relation in Turku. But if you should compare somehow uh, Turku to other places, say, in the Central Europe or Southern Europe and or you know towns anyway, mm. is Turku in some way you know, uh, have own characters or as it was all or all, all, all places? I, I I think that the animals were present in towns uh, in much greater extent in all around Europe. However, um, in Turku and let's say in the small country uh, in, in, in small towns. Uh, here in the uh, northern area, animals were perhaps even more present because um, in larger towns in Central Europe, people were, for example, buying meat rather than keeping animals and raising them themselves. They were probably not also slaughtered in their backyards often. They were just, you know, uh, buying from professionals. But in Turku, we didn't have the professionals. Yeah. Yes. I had two questions. One, was there a particular can you ask your question a bit louder? Because, yeah. Uh, I mean, there is, maybe it's because there is noise here from behind the door. I don't know if everyone's here. Um, so my first question was, if you have a typical family living in medieval Turku, who does the slaughtering? And the second, do you know anything more about what you can find about like bees or other insects that people would keep archaeologically? like? Is anything kept, <laughs> you know, preserved? Yeah. Um, uh, we we assume again. We do, we don't know who was doing this slaw slaughtering. If we think of how things were done uh, in later periods in 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 Finland, it was probably the um, man of the household that was doing it. Uh, it could also, here in Turku, it could well have been sometimes at least some professional who, who, who did it. But it was you, you usually done within the farm, by their own farm. Uh, so it was really some sort of thing that was not, it, 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 it was not thought that you needed a professional to do it. So it was, it was a skill that you should be able to handle yourself. So the other part was about insects, right? Yeah, you know? bees. bees. Yeah. They are preserved, but thus, then again, outside my expertise, I know that um, they have been studied here in Turku to some extent, and um, I'm co-authoring uh, an uh, article about uh, that latrine stuff, yeah, <laughs> um, about insects there as well. But um, uh, I'm afraid I can't tell you um, more about because I don't really know. Uh, they don't have bones. <laughs> But uh, more information should be coming out if 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 uh, we get the ar article published at some point. But yeah, uh, we know that there were quite different kind of insects living because there were different kind of environments. There were wet areas, um, so they were kind of uh, typical for for um, like any um, wet meadows and uh, stuff. But then there were insects that were more specific to living in an urban human contact. There were uh, animals like in manure, for example, uh, insects like in manure, for example. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. <laughs> yes, um, uh, Matteo, please. Uh, a curiosity. So, like you said, for instance, that you examined like uh, a thousand something kilograms of like how much of this is actually like you can tell this is this animal and how much is like I can't tell anything about this remain like this. Yeah. 
Bard. Um, a quite a good proportion of of those bones I could identify. I think it might be something 70% uh, identified, 30% unidentified, but that always depends on how um, well the material was sieved, so <coughs> how small fragments they took. So if you just pick up the larger chunks of bone, then obviously you can identify most of them. If you uh, take a water sieving with one millimeter sieve and pick up every every piece of bone you have in the material then you have a much greater number of unidentified but the ma bone material in Turku is exceptionally well preserved so that's why a great extent can be actually identified <laughs> Hello. Um, did uh, the long, dark, cold Finnish winter cause any specific kind of characteristics in the way that animals were kept yeah. in, um, <laughs> in Finland? Indeed, indeed. Um, that was the uh, central problem for the uh, Finnish animal husbandry. I would say from the uh, very start when first domestic animals were brought in Turku to the um, uh, 20th, well, 19th century, 20th century, when hay was starting to uh, be cultivated, and you know proper warm cow sheds were started to build. So um, the major problem was um, the winter feeding. So you couldn't keep animals outside; there wasn't enough food. So you had to collect the food for um, up to seven months, pen penning inside, and that's a lot. Um, what they did practically, uh, they starved the animals during the winter. So they were fed minimal amounts of uh, food so that they barely were alive. I mean, in bad springs, it was quite common that some of them starved to death. Yeah. So um, that's one reason why they were, they were very small. Um, the medieval cow uh, was about this high. So if, if you look at the medieval uh, wall paintings, for example, of, 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 um, in medieval churches, and you see that the animals are really, really small, um, they are actually in you know, the real size. Yeah. Skins of the painter. <laughs> OK. Yes. Maybe this is a little bit related to the previous question, but you mentioned about this pet raven or wild raven. and. Uh, it could be probably uh, make the difference between these two two categories by examining the nutrition and, and the bone structure. Is it more like the size of the bones, or is there really some markers in the bones? You can make a difference between these two things. Yeah, um, this is something that um, I have also been uh, co-authoring um, this type of, of, of studies. Um, you can, I know, I'm, I'm, I'm not expert myself, but um, I know something about it. Uh, you can do a stable isotope analysis uh, of bones, and that tells you something about animal or human's diet. For example, how much in, 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 in humans, how much fish people were eating versus meat. And um, I know that this kind of approach has been used in turkeys in in um, um, americas when they were examining which were the first domesticated turkeys and which were the wild turkeys and they saw a difference in the diet because the other ones were hunted and the other ones were kept in the settlements and fed with different um, food so i was just wondering that it might be possible uh, but we would have to, we would need a reference samples for wild ravens to see what kind of uh, values are typical for them and then compare with that one. So, but it might be possible that that one was, if it was pet, it was eating different kind of uh, food and then again it would show in the, in the bones. Uh, also, yes, if we have a complete skeleton, I mean that was only a skull, a mandible and one wing, wing bone, we could perhaps compare um, um, the, the uh, complete skeleton and see 
for example, that it was not flying anymore or something like that, but yeah. Yes? Did, did you uh, ever find animal and human remains commingled, either because they were buried with humans or because some humans were disliked so much that they were tossed with the animals? And, uh... um, in the medieval <coughs> Turku, there are, let's say that there are always some human remains mingling with the animal remains. Um, we have some uh, human bones coming from um, these, uh, these um, normal, let's say, dump or household layers. Uh, interpretation of those is also uh, difficult. Uh, I mean, they just really could be um, uh, mixed up layers from previous graves, or um, it could be that some um, kids were bringing in human bones from a graveyard and, you know, having fun, or pigs, we, we know that, you know, pigs went into the graveyards and dug up graves if it was possible. Um, but they also may have ritual connection here in Turku. Um, but no, uh, not in that sense that you were mentioning, because we don't have medieval graveyards uh, examined well here. And I doubt that they would be perhaps buried in, the, in, the, in that kind of way. I actually do have a question uh, before um, seeing if uh, this is my moment. <laughs> I will ask this question. <laughs> so uh, I I'm very interested in uh, knowing how people decide to study something. I mean, how this became your your um, research field and and uh, you know your, your job actually. So what yeah. how on earth? Yes, indeed. <laughs> yeah. How on, on um, yeah, that is a good question. I have been actually thinking about that a lot. <laughs> Why on earth? Um, I guess that, um, I, I mean, I have been always interested about animals. Um, but it was clear to me that I was not made for vet, for example, no. Um, or a farmer, or any, any by, I, I, by I, exclusion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The theoretic, theoretic. So, uh, I went into archaeology because I was interested in history, but I absolutely have no memory for names or numbers. So, I mean, I couldn't do history. And um, then um, I started to study archaeology. It was fine. I was actually um, always almost decided to change the archaeology to geology. I already have the transferring papers ready and signed. But then I got uh, information that I was accepted to do the bone uh, course in Stockholm. Uh, off I went. I guess that I applied there because when I was doing my uh, pro seminar in, in archaeology, um, I was kind of going through all the things that we have been uh, studying and you know, trying to find the one that I found the most interesting. And it was always the part when it was that blah, 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 settlement, blah, blah, blah. And in the osteological analysis, otter, beaver, uh, fish, and, and bird bones were found. It was always that part that I found the most interesting. Yeah, it, it is the animal connection. Um, living animals are great, but um, yeah, dead. As good as dead. Dead <laughs> animals are great as well. <laughs> that is well. Bones are the best, yeah. OK, so yes. I'm, I'm curious, can you, you could, because those material you presented is mostly from a PhD, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, can you mostly. continue your research in Luken? Um, uh, perhaps, yes, yeah. If I get funding. <laughs> <laughs> it's the, always the big question, isn't it? Um, so let's see. Yes. I don't know the animals very well, but I think on your first or second slide you had like this goat with like four horns. Oh yes. Is that typical? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I guess my question was, what was the most like freaky thing that you see? <laughs> <laughs> I like this question. It's Halloween actually, almost, no? Yeah, uh, this is from the collections of, of uh, Turku University. Uh, Zoological Museum. Um, 
I have tried to find out where it actually comes from. It is a four-horned goat. Four-horned sheep are quite common, actually. There is a breed, uh, Jacob's sheep, that, um, um, uh, you know, the major feature is that the rams have four horns, but uh, four-horned goats are much more rare. Um, the, I, I think the freakiest thing I have, I have seen is, uh, they, they are the pathological bones, you know. And I, 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 I think my top number one is actually from human. It's, it's, it's uh, from Stockholm, where I uh, studied. It, it was in their um, um, teaching collection. It is the human arm bones with uh, wrist bones with these bones. They are all crossed together in one big clump. So th that person had a horrible accident. It crossed her. It, it, it was from a fe female, a wrist, so that every, every, everything was, was um, uh, uh, healed as a solid clump. I mean, I mean, that must have hurt, like, a lot, you know, all the nerves and all the stuff. So that was, th that, that's the freakiest thing, I, I, I think, to think the pain that person in a medieval period was living with, with no proper uh, pain medication. Horrid. Please ask something else. We don't want Happy. to end on this Happy. note, no? Uh, and yes. Yeah, yeah, good, good. <laughs> <laughs> Katie? <laughs> no. no, it's just, you mentioned kind of birds in the context of game. So I'm just curious that there were no domesticated geese or ducks at this time in Turku at all, were there? Yeah, there probably was. Um, they were not common. We know... Um, the most historical records we have are from ma uh, manors and from castle, and we know that those uh, had domestic geese and, and, and uh, ducks, but uh, did the ordinary people have them? Very little survives. Uh, I think from the archaeological um, bone material, um, we can deduce that they probably did but not much. I mean, there are, it is difficult to identify these domestic forms because the wild uh, versions are available as well. So um, it is something that we don't certainly know, but we assume that pe some people did, perhaps the re uh, richer folk. Yeah, but, uh, but they were not common here as uh, in the other uh, uh, countries, for example, in, in, in Europe. And then from the, the pictures I saw, people knew what a chicken was, but they didn't necessarily have any chickens yes. here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. like uh, in, the, in the medieval uh, church wall paintings, there are um, uh, donkeys. And it is clear that, um, you know, the, the Jesus rides with the donkey. And it is clear from the some of the pictures that probably the one that painted it has never seen a donkey. But, you know, it, um, it, it's kind of copied. Um, from other pictures, um, the same style. Um, so I uh, yes, I and in some of the pictures that should have a donkey in Finland, the donkey looks so much like a horse that it might, you know, m m might be a horse. But yeah, yeah. Um, th there is a unicorn as well in Church of Lohja or Hattula. So yeah. <laughs> But no bones, not yet. Ah, <laughs> unfortunately, no. <laughs> let's see. Who has one last question? This is. Yeah? Happy question, happy question. Uh, these uh, animals which are domesticated, like pigs and horses, uh, there are no wild versions in around Turu, so they came from elsewhere and were separate completely from the wildlife. Yep, yes, yep. That's it. Um, that is a good question and um, something that um, my postdoc was <laughs> then about. Um, and actually this um, project I'm doing now is kind of continuing the same theme. Um, so yes, all the, all the domestic animals we have here in Finland were brought elsewhere and the they came from domestication center from, from near east. So um, it was a long way, for example, from, uh, for a cattle 
that was living in Near East to, to adapt to the life in seven month uh, cold and darkness in, 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 in Finland. But yeah, yeah. For everyone, it's a difficult <laughs> thing. <laughs> okay. Yes. So, um, well, I think that um, if there are no more urgent questions, you know that uh, um, Auli will be staying here for a while, for the next half an hour or so. So you can, if you have more questions and you just want to go and chat with her, um, you can do it. Uh, and um, before uh, thanking uh, Ali again, I have to say uh, that we have uh, next month uh, another science cafe. This will be a different topic. Um, it will be about uh, <laughs> well, a different topic. It's, uh, it's, it's different also because it's about light in a way while you are more um, studying, uh, you know, the dark side <laughs> of the town. That depends Somehow. on the point of view, but yeah. yeah maybe. <laughs> okay. So, and, and this will be uh, Dr. Tom Kusela from uh, University of Turku. Uh, he will talk about uh, light and coherent light in particular. Uh, it's next um, month in November. I don't remember the date, but if you follow us in the uh, Facebook, um, you, will, uh, you will know it. Uh, and um, this was very interesting, and I was very happy because there was uh, quite a nice discussion after. So thank you so much again. Thank you all. Thank you.